the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. So, is God right-handed or left-handed? I would say left-handed. Dustin, you're a righty. I'm a lefty. Perhaps you think it's kind of a silly question, and it is, but I ask that question in all seriousness today because our readings teach us that the answer is both. Theology, or the study of God's word, calls the civil government and authorities, as talked about in the book of Romans today, as the kingdom of God's left hand, and the church, as we heard in our reading from Matthew today, as the kingdom of God's right hand. Both are his. He exercises authority in both, and he blesses us both in different ways. The kingdom of the left, the civil government and authorities, rule and bless us by the law. They exist to protect us and punish evildoers. They exist to restrain sin by enforcing the law so that there is not anarchy and chaos, so that we can live in peace and order in this world. Now, they don't do it perfectly. They are sinners, too. But murderers and thieves and the like are still brought to justice. We turn to the police and to the courts when we have been wronged or are in need of protection. And we are punished when we break the law. And this is a great blessing from God and how he is mercifully restraining the sin and the evil that seeks to tear our world apart. The kingdom of the right, the church, is concerned about sin too, but in a much different way. For it is not by law and punishment and coercion that the church is ruled, but by grace and forgiveness. The church calls sinners not to justice, but to repentance. She exercises not vengeance, but love. You could say the government deals with sin from the outside, from the outside in. But the church deals with the sin from inside out. God restraining sin by healing our hearts and our minds with the medicine of his word and sacraments. And of course, this is a great blessing too. The greatest blessing, in fact. To have in Jesus a savior from sin and evil that seeks always to tear us apart from God. So God is both right-handed and left-handed. Dealing with sin in both kingdoms for our good. Because contrary to what is often our attitude, God takes sin quite seriously. Like when he impressed upon the prophet Ezekiel how important this was, this was no joke or optional matter to him. But what about us? We're sorry when we get caught, when the policeman pulls us over for speeding, when the IRS audit letter arrives in the mail, when our lies don't hold up anymore, when our teachers catch us cheating, or when your parents find out that you really didn't clean your room after all, you just shoved everything in the closet and under the bed. But if we don't get caught, that just emboldens us to do some more, which is dangerous because the evil one, the devil, is never satisfied with you just getting away with it. He wants to rule us, to dominate us, to take us over with sin, severing us from others and from God. So God has not only established the kingdom of the left to restrain and punish our outward sins even more, he is concerned with the sin in our hearts. So while we maybe think it's funny to get someone to sin, to poke at them or provoke them or tempt them with our words or our deeds, Jesus says 
that it's better for us to have cement shoes on our feet and to be cast into the depths of the sea. Or the sin that we think is harmless, our hands doing what they should not do, our feet taking us to places we should not be, our eyes seeing what we should not see. And today we could say whether that's physically or going to places to see things virtually on the internet. Jesus says it would be better for us to hack off our hands and our feet and to gouge out our eyes. But that's not how we think about sin, is it? Which should be an indication just how really sick we are. That we consider rebellion and disobedience lightly. An indication that the disease of sin has been festering and growing in our bodies and our souls. And we don't even realize how bad it is. Just like you felt fine until some, something burst in on you. Or until the doctor walked into the room and said, I have bad news. Yes, our condition is really that bad. And it would be terminal. We would have no hope if getting better were up to us. But surrounding these terrifying and sobering words of Jesus are words quite different. Words of hope for us. For greatness in the kingdom of heaven... As we had heard, that's not something you do, but something that is given to you. Like a little baby brought to the waters of holy baptism. A child who is brought to those waters, a sinner receives God's name. Adopted into the family, the gift of faith, the Holy Spirit, the forgiveness of sins and the promise of life everlasting. And every child is dear to our Father in heaven. You are his child. These gifts of baptism are for you too. Not to earn, but to receive. You see, God's right hand is not about growing up, but about going down in repentance. Returning to our baptism And receiving like a little child from your good and gracious Father in heaven. Being drowned daily in those waters of life. Instead of the sea with a millstone around our necks. And then as we heard, your Father has angels to take care of you. And when we wander off and go astray, our good shepherd searches us out. Even if you're just one in a hundred He notices and he cares. He wants no one to perish. So when you and I are called to repentance, caught in our sin, don't get angry or defiant or defensive. Instead, we need to thank God for his word proclaimed to us in love. To call us back to repent and receive his words of forgiveness. As you heard again this morning... Your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And they really are. For as we heard Jesus say to his church, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And when we return and gather together with our brothers and sisters in Christ, even if it's just two or three, For greatness in this kingdom is not measured by achievement or age or size or intellect. Wherever two or three are gathered, I am in their midst. And he really is. Not in just some mystical, untouchable and unknowable way, but in real fleshy ways. Here in his body and blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Those are important words. For remember those terrifying and sober words that should happen if a millstone hacking and gouging all of our members apart? Here's the answer. Given and shed for you. The hands and the feet and the eyes of Jesus were given for you on the cross. 
the millstone that each one of us deserved to be hung around our, fa- our neck is instead placed on his neck. And the fires of hell that he endured so that you never will. Given and shed for you his precious blood, his cleansing blood. For it is he now who is in the midst of us, his disciples. Did you notice that? These words put us back where we started. Except the child in the midst of us now is Jesus himself. Here he is in the midst for you. He is in the midst of you not as an example, but to forgive your sins and give you life. That's all we really need. And for that end, God uses both his hands, his left and his right, ruling all things for the good of you and me to give us life. Protected from sin, but even more, life forever. But both with your Father, your God, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is with us now, and we will be with him forever. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith to Christ Jesus, to life everlasting. Amen. Thank you.